Okay. Assalamu alaikum and good morning everyone. Um, today we're just going to recap on uh, what we did last lesson, the relationship between rate equation and mechanism. Okay. This is by looking at a specific example that you have, uh, you should be familiar with from your AS, which is the nucleophilic substitution of your halogenal alkanes or haloalkanes. SN1 and SN2. Um, SN1, S stands for substitution, N stands for nucleophilic, and 1 means it is unimolecular mechanism. Okay, So from the previous lesson, unimolecular mechanism means there's only one species uh, present in your slow rate determining step. Okay, So that means um, the first attack if you want to, if you don't remember this, the first um, step in an SN1 does not involve a nucleophile. It just involves the halogen alkene itself. Okay. Um, right. So this is the slow step, the first step. Only since there's only one species, unimolecular, that means you don't have the nucleophile attacking. So the only possible um, movement for the halogenal alkene is for it to break the bond first okay then after the first stage which is the breaking of the bond then only the nucleophile come, comes in and that second step is called the fast step okay so i will not go into details on the mechanism um, so these are the two steps that make up this one whole equation okay the first step is the slow step and the second one is the fast step and as you can see because this is the slow step that means halogeno alkanes is written down in the red equation but not the hydroxide ion right uh, because that's what we said any species any reactants that appear in the slow rate determining step will appear in the red equation by the same amount so you have one molecule of halogenal alkanes here that means the power is also one it means that it's first order okay when you write down your rate um, don't forget your rate constant k okay uh, the next one is sn2 the two gives you a hint that it is a bimolecular mechanism okay when you have a bimolecular mechanism you have two species in the slow rate determining step so if we look at the equation, the possible two species is the halogen alkane and the nucleophile itself, right? So um, the nucleophile attacks the halogen alkanes uh, break, um, and there's not much step here. There's only one step, which is the slow step. Okay, and then you form products. Um, so again, the rate equation should include the species, the reactants that is in the slow rate determining step. In this case, it's the halogen alkane. You only have one molecule of that. Therefore, it's to the power of one. Hydroxide ion, you only have one species of that. Therefore, the order is one. Okay. Uh, one thing that I forgot to mention that in mechanisms, you will see intermediates. Okay. So the intermediates in this case is um, this carbocation ion right ch33c plus okay we call it a carbocat ion but the intermediate will later on be uh, used up so you can see that the intermediate react further to form the product and if you add these two steps up the intermediates should cancel each other because um, they are present on both sides one on the left one on the right that's why in the overall equation you don't see intermediate Okay, usually the species that is in the mechanism, in the steps, in the stages, which are not in the equation, we tend to call them intermediates. Okay. Right, uh, moving on. So moving away from the rate equation and the mechanism, um, the next one is to devise a suitable experimental technique for studying the rate of reaction. Okay, so how do we study the rate of reaction? Usually when we talk about rate, it's about the uh, change in concentration. Okay, you can either monitor uh, the change in concentration of the product, in which case it would be increasing, 
or you can monitor the uh, change in concentration of reactant, in which case it would be decreasing over time. Okay, so these are some of the uh, experimental methods to learn or to study to monitor uh, the reaction. Okay, um, so this is what I was talking about. Uh, the method will measure either the rate of disappearance of a reactant okay uh, how your reactant is being used up over time or the rate of appearance of a product that means uh, how much your product is um, released or produced over time there are two types of methods the first one is the continuous method this is um, the one that you are familiar with reaction mixture is monitored over a period of time okay uh, second one is the sampling method involves taking small samples of the reaction mixture and then you analyze it. So I will talk about the sampling method later on because it's the one that is uh, less familiar. Uh, we'll talk about the continuous method first, which is the one that is more familiar uh, to you. Okay, the first one is mass loss, right? Um, you have carried this out in practical, okay? Uh, well, not really looking at the rate of reaction, um, mass loss is used for um, a reaction that produces gas. Okay? Why? Because if it produces gas, right, generally for reactions that produces gaseous products, when you produce gas, you let the gas escape. Okay? When the gas escape, you are losing mass. Right? More over time, you have more and more gas escaping, so your mass will be smaller and smaller. From here, you can calculate the rate of reaction, okay? How? Simply by plotting the constant, um, simply by plotting the mass over time, right? So you can see that the mass will be decreasing just like the uh, graph of a um, concentration time of a reactant, okay? When a, gas, when a gas is evolved, when a gas, when a gas is evolved during a reaction, monitoring mass loss may provide a suitable method of measuring the reaction rate. So one example is the reaction of acid with metal, okay? In which case you produce salt and hydrogen gas. So the hydrogen gas will be escaped, will, be, will evaporate um, to the air. So there will be a decrease in mass, okay? So this works for any other reaction that produces um, gas as well. Right, like uh, reaction with acid and carbonate. So where you produce uh, carbon dioxide, you can use this method, okay? How does this method work? Basically, uh, you put your reaction mixture in a beaker or in a flask and then just put it on the balance. Um, sometimes uh, it's connected to a computer, but if, we, if you were to do this realistically in the lab, you, would just, you wouldn't be using a, a computer, you would just, uh, take time intervals, maybe say every two minutes, you record the mass, the, 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 the reading from the weighing balance, okay? Um, simple. The second one is monitoring reaction rate using volume of gas, right? So again, this is um, applicable for reactions that produces gaseous products. You can choose the first method or the second method. Sometimes for a particular uh, reaction, there are more than one possible method to study the rate of reaction, okay? Uh, so changes in gas volume or, ga or gas pressure can be measured. So this, um, this method is called the gas collection method, okay? You measure the gas that you collect over time. Same thing, every two minutes, you read the uh, reading, depending on the apparatus that you use, okay? And the first possible uh, setup is by uh, connecting your reaction flask to a syringe, okay? Over time, the syringe uh, will, um, the gas here will increase, so that will move your syringe to the right if you're looking at this diagram, okay? The other possible setup is the collection of water, uh, uh, sorry, the collection of gas in water displacement. This is the one that you have, I don't have the diagram here. This is the one that you have done in um, practical. Same thing, okay? You fill in your measuring cylinder with water and then you invert it, okay? You start re your reaction. Over time, you will see the water level rising. This tells you how much volume you are collecting. 
okay in order but if you want to monitor the reaction rate you need to measure the volume and time okay the time factor is also important so it's not just measuring the 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 gas products that you uh form Okay. So, if you have a reaction of calcium carbonate with um, HCl, so this is an example of a of an acid with carbonate where you are where you are releasing carbon dioxide, you may collect carbon dioxide using the gas syringe or in an inverted water filled burette or measuring cylinder. Okay. Um, this is a collection of gas through water displacement. Um, there's a stopwatch because. Um, Sometimes in paper five, they will ask you to design experiment or uh, draw a setup to monitor the rate of reaction. So students are able to draw all this setup, but yet they forget the time factor. Okay, the time factor involves stopwatch or stop clock. Next one, monitoring monitoring reaction rate using small changes in volume. This is something that you haven't done. Um, this uh, method requires what we call a dilatometer. Okay, this dilatometer uh, looks something like this. Okay, it has a um, narrow, very narrow capillary tube. Right. The reason why it has a very narrow capillary tube is that so that it can detect very small change in volume. Okay, so this is especially important when you are producing, um, when your reaction has an, an increase in volume, but very little increase, okay? The increase, you will not be able to read it off from a balance because it's too small, right? Um, so if you cannot weigh it, if you cannot weigh the increase in mass, then you just use um, this dilatometer, okay? So when the reaction is producing uh, a little, uh, an increase in small volume, then you can see that the water level will just rise. And because it's a capillary tube, it's a narrow tube, small rise or small increase in volume will show a significant change in the scale. Okay. Um, okay, so the temperature of the reaction mix mixture has to be controlled. The reason why the temperature has to be controlled is because they are liquid. Uh, well, for any reaction, in fact, uh, you need to control the temperature because if the temperature changes, if it increases, for example, this liquid will expand. When it expands, the level, what the liquid level will rise. This indicates that, um, that there is an increase in volume, but actually, it's not from the reaction, it's from the expansion of the liquid because, um, because of change in temperature. So it's extremely important that you keep the temperature constant, okay? Because you don't want any other factor to cause changes in your breathing, just from the reaction alone, okay? Um, oh, this is an example for uh, the hydration of um, an alkene where the volume decreases. So whether the volume increases or decreases, um, it doesn't matter as long as it's a very small change. Okay. Next is uh, using the formation of precipitate. This is also something that you have done in your practical as well. Um, this is especially important if you start, if your reaction start with a colorless solution and then the product is producing solid precipitate. Okay, so you can actually uh, take the time for the precipitate to form and cover whatever writings that you have at the bottom of the flask. Okay, so j let me just remind you that you have carried out this um, practical where you have an insert. An insert is a paper with writing. You put it um, on the table and then on top of that paper writing, you put your reaction flask or reaction mixture. Um, and then you mix your reactants. Uh, this is a reaction between uh, thiosulfate, um, thiosulfate and iron, is it, if I'm not mistaken? Does it not give you in the... 
yeah, it gives you the equation, okay? Thiosulfate and acid, sorry, thiosulfate and acid, you form sodium chloride, which is colorless, water is colorless, solid sulfur is the one that will be produced as precipitate, okay? And then sulfur dioxide will just um, evaporate as, it, as gas. Okay, uh, the thumb rule for this reaction is that you need to start with a clear solution, okay? If you started with a cloudy solution already, it will be difficult for you to tell um, when to stop, okay? You usually stop the reaction when your writing at the bottom of your flask can no longer be seen, okay? So you can use that to monitor rate of reaction as well. This is something that you haven't done. Uh, this is measuring in electrical conductivity, okay? Um, electrical conductivity usually involves ions. So if your equations or reactions have ions present in it, you can use, um, you can measure the electrical conductivity using a pH meter, okay? Usually in the exam, you wouldn't have access to a pH meter, but um, this is a possible, possible question that they would ask uh, in paper five, okay? Uh, all you have to do is draw a reaction uh, mixture in a beaker and then have a pH meter connected to a computer, done, okay? Other things that you need to know, maybe uh, record the pH meter every um, two minutes or every uh, specified time interval, okay? Basically, they want to see, if you look at this reaction, your ions are in the uh, reactant. That means your ions will be used up over time, okay? So your electrical conductivity should be decreasing over time. If you're producing ions in the product, over time, your conductivity will increase. Okay, I hope that's clear. Uh, next one is a calorimeter. Mm, you have not done this. Um, I think bio students may know or may have done this uh, or may be familiar with it. A calorimeter is a, an instrument that you use to measure color. Okay. Now, uh, color can also be used um, as uh, monitoring the rate of reaction. But however, we cannot use our naked eye because our naked eye can only say, oh, this is darker, this is lighter, okay? With a colorimeter, the color is telling you the concentration, okay? The darker the color is, the higher the concentration. The lighter the color is, the lower the concentration. Now, with our eye, we're only able to, um, to do this qualitatively, but not quantitatively. Okay, with a colorimeter, they can give you numbers, some numbers. Darker, darker color or high intensity would give you a bigger number. Lighter color or lighter intensity would give you a smaller number. But of course, this type of method can only be used with reactions that have colors in their either their reactants or products. If all this, the species are colorless, then there's no use to be uh, it's useless to use colorimeter, okay? Because colorimeter measures color or intensity, okay? So this involves a color substance either in the reactant or product. Same thing. If you're, sorry, I won't use this example. Oh yeah, I can use this example. If you look at this um, equation, there's your ketone, there's your iodine, there is your product, and there's your hydrogen iodide. And this will be colorless, colorless, colorless. Only iodine will be colored, depending on the concentration. If you have a high concentration of iodine, um, it would be really dark, um, depends, dark gray, dark purple, or dark yellow, okay? So it depends on what you start with. So over time, because your iodine is the one that's colored and it's in the reactant, over time, the color will be uh, getting lighter, okay? If your product is the one that is colored, over time it gets darker, okay? Right, um, so this is generally for reactions with different colored reactants or end products. Right, the second one is the sampling method. I don't have much on the sampling method, but um, I think your textbook should 
uh, mention more about the sampling method. Now, just because I don't have a lot of information about this doesn't mean that this will not be asked in the exam. Okay, so how does the sampling method works? Now, just um, imagine having this uh, reactants in your beaker. Okay, you have this reactants in a beaker and then the, this reaction is happening. Okay, now you, all, of course, you always have to time them. You always have to check the concentration. In this case, all of them are colorless. Okay, so I cannot use the colorimeter, um, but I can, see, I have a hydroxide ion. I can actually find the concentration of hydroxide ion via titration. Okay, usually for titration, we use H plus or um, OH minus ions. Okay, now how is this sampling method, um, how does some sampling method works? Okay, so I let this reaction happen in a beaker and then uh, maybe at interval of five minutes, okay? Every five minutes, I will take a sample, I will take a small amount of liquid from my reaction mixture, okay? So the first sample that I take is for my five minutes, okay? Now this sample is at five minutes, but remember, the reaction is continuing, okay? The reaction is continuous, right? I haven't stopped. So at five minutes, if I want my sample to be true at five minutes, I need to stop that particular reaction from my sample, okay? This is what I call quenching, right? So five minutes, I take maybe 10 centimeter cube from my beaker and then I stop the reaction. Later on at 10 minutes, I take another sample from my reaction mixture, 10 centimeter cube of it, and then I stop that sample. I am not stopping the reaction in my original beaker or original flask. This reaction is still going on, but in my sample, the reaction, I stop it. Okay, so that's the difference between sampling method and continuous. Continuous, it's quite obvious. You study, you monitor the rate of reaction over time until the reaction finishes, okay? Here, you only take a sample from your beaker. Okay, I hope that is clear. Um, so sampling method involves taking small samples of the reaction mixture at various times. So this has to be a time interval and then carrying out a chemical analysis on each sample. Okay, so my sample at five minutes just now, I want to uh, calculate the concentration. So what do I do? I carry out a titration. Okay, but first I need to stop the reaction first in the sample only. Okay, um, this stopping of reaction is called quenching, quenched. Okay, uh, one of the methods of quenching is to add ice. So if the reaction mixture, sorry, if the sample is cold enough, then the reaction would stop. Okay, now the reason why we want to stop the reaction is because with sampling method, you don't carry out the analysis immediately. You cannot possibly carry out, okay, I have the sample at five minutes, I carry out titration now. No, because during, between the time you take out sample and you carry out um, titration, the reaction is still moving. Okay, the reaction is still moving and that means that sample does not represent uh, the concentration at five minutes. Okay, it's not accurate. So if you want to be accurate, you need to stop that reaction at five minutes. Okay, but you don't stop the whole reaction, only inside the sample. Um, then the concentration of the OH- minus can be found by titration with a standard solution of strong acid. Okay, so this is generally for reactions that contain H plus or OH- minus on one side of the equation or other ions that can, be, that can be carried out uh, in a titration method, okay? So there are some other uh, reactions as well that can be carried out um, using a titration method, which is like iron, okay? Um, right, so moving away from rate of reaction and monitoring, how do you monitor rate? How do you study the rate of a reaction? We now move on to catalysts, okay? 
So that's your learning objective. There are two types of catalysts, the heterogeneous catalyst and the homogeneous catalyst. Hetero means different, okay? The catalyst is in a different phase to the reactants. Homogeneous means the catalyst is in the same phase and as the reactants, okay? Now, what is phase? Phase is not the same as state, okay? Phase is when a boundary exists between two components. For example, water and oil. Both of them are liquid. Okay, they are in the same state, but because they do not mix, they're, they're, they are two different layers, we call them, we say that they are in two different phases. Okay, so just remember if your catalyst mix with your reactants, it's homogeneous. If your catalyst does not mix with your reactant, it's heterogeneous. Uh, we're going to look at the heterogeneous catalyst first. The famous example is the Haber process, okay, where you have a, a nitrogen gas reacting with hydrogen gas in the presence of an iron catalyst. So your reactants are gas, your catalyst is a solid, okay. So for a heterogeneous um, catalysis, uh, it often involves gaseous molecules reacting at the surface of a solid catalyst. So it is, there are steps in um, the function of heterogeneous catalysis, okay? So using iron in the Haber process as an example, we're going to look at these five steps, okay? The first step is, yeah, you have this diagram in your notes. The first step is the diffusion, okay? Diffusion of reactants onto the surface. Okay? Your reactants move to the surface of the catalyst, right? So nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas reactants diffuse to the surface of the catalyst. Once they have moved to the surface of the catalyst, the second stage is the adsorption. Now do not confuse adsorption with absorption. Okay, adsorb means it sticks, it sticks onto the surface. Absorb means it goes through, okay, just like a sponge, it absorbs water. That means the water goes inside the sponge, right? Adsorb means it just sticks onto the surface of the catalyst, okay? How does this, um, how, do, how do this reactant stick? Okay, they actually stick, uh, there's a force, there's an attractive force called the intermolecular forces. Okay, so the intermolecular forces is the one that sticks the uh, reactants onto the surface. Okay, um, however, your intermolecular forces must be strong enough to weaken the covalent bonds within the nitrogen, nitrogen, and hydrogen, hydrogen, so the atoms can react together, but weak enough to break. Okay, so what do, what does, what do these two points mean? Basically, when you're reacting, uh, when your reactants stick onto the surface, the bond between them start to break. Okay, you see this? Hydrogen, hydrogen, single bond. Once it sticks onto the surface of the catalyst, the bond is broken. Why? Because you need the atoms to uh, form new products. Okay, likewise for the nitrogen triple bond nitrogen, once it sticks to the surface, the bond breaks. Okay, so that's why we say that um, the intermolecular forces need to be strong enough to break the covalent bonds. Okay. Now, once you have atoms, the, the next stage would be reaction. Okay, so your atoms will combine. So for NH3, you need one nitrogen atom and you need two hydrogen atoms. That's why you need to break them down into atoms first. Okay, because you want to combine N with H and NH. Okay, so reaction is happening. <clears throat> On the surface of the catalyst, after reaction is done, desorption happen. Desorption is the opposite of adsorption. Instead of sticking, now you are releasing. You are unsticking the product. Okay, This is what we said that your intermolecular forces must not be too strong. Okay, Strong enough to hold the 
reactants, but weak enough to let the products go. If it's very, very strong, then your products will not be able to leave the catalyst. Okay, And then after that, it's diffusion where your product just diffuses away from the surface. Okay, Right. Um, next one is the catalytic removal of oxides of nitrogen in car exhausts. This is still an example of a heterogeneous catalysis. Okay, um, Catalytic converters, you have learned this in topic sulfur and nitrogen in AS. Okay, um, the catalyst for uh, in your car exhaust is your transition metals, platinum, palladium, or RH. Okay, um, I can't remember what RH is. I have been meaning to check it up. Right now, uh, this metal is coated. Uh, onto a honeycomb structure. The reason why we have this honeycomb structure is to increase the surface area, okay? Maximize the surface area. So the higher surface area you have for the catalyst, uh, the faster and the more efficient your reaction is, okay? So what is this catalytic converter? What it does is that it transforms your more harmful gas into a less or a harmless gas, okay? Now you may argue carbon dioxide is not really that harmless, because it's a uh, carbon dioxide gas, okay? So basically we're turning a harmful one into a less harmful gases. And um, that is using the catalyst of either platinum or palladium or RH, okay? Or a combination of all. So it depends on how uh, the catalytic converter is designed, okay? So as you can see, this is gas, gas, your catalyst is a solid. So this is heterogeneous catalysis. How does it work? Same way as the five method or five steps, five stages that was described um, earlier on. So that's how a honeycomb uh, structure looks like. That's to increase the surface area. Okay. Uh, you don't have to worry about this. I don't even know what that is, um, but I found the photo on the internet. Um, right, uh, for this one, I will just ask you to um, copy. It works the same way, okay, um, except that we don't include diffusion. Okay, the first step is adsorption. I'm just going to go through this quickly and let you copy this later. I send it to uh, on WhatsApp because I only have five minutes left. So your reactants will stick, adsorb onto the uh, catalyst. That's adsorption. The reaction, whilst they are being absorbed, once they stick, the carbon monoxide uh, bond breaks, the nitrogen monoxide bonds also break, okay? Reaction is the combination of your atoms to form your product, right? Weakening of the covalent bonds and then formation of new bonds, okay? So to form carbon dioxide, you need CO molecule to react with oxygen. To form nitrogen, that's quite obvious, you need two nitrogen atoms to form N2 molecules. And lastly, desorption is once you form products, the product is being released. Desorption. Okay. Last one, catalyst poisoning. Just like how you say enzyme is being, enzymes being denatured. Okay. But catalyst poisoning happens when uh, a substance that is not involved in the reaction. I'm guessing this is inhibitors. Okay. When inhibitors uh, absorb strongly onto the surface of the catalyst, then the catalyst cannot be used anymore, okay? So that's why I say on this part, you cannot have a very strong uh, bond, okay? So if we have an unwanted reactant or unwanted molecule binding onto the surface of the catalyst in a very, very strong bond, then you cannot let them go. They cannot go, so it becomes poison. Okay, so that's how catal catalyst poisoning works in uh, inorganic. Okay, for enzymes, I think you have a different, uh, quite same idea, but different explanation. The inhibitor binds to the active site, and then I don't know what it does there. Um, and then, uh, so the enzymes cannot work, something like that. Okay, but in the case of a catalyst, 
we have an unwanted molecule. Unwanted molecule means anything else other than hydrogen and nitrogen molecules, okay, because they are not involved in the reaction. So, for example, we say we have oxygen, okay, we have a, a oxygen which is not in the reaction to form ammonia, then oxygen binds really strong to the surface, okay. Because it binds really strong, we cannot release it, right? The oxygen just stick onto the catalyst. So then your hydrogen and nitrogen molecules cannot come in because it's being covered or poisoned by oxygen. Okay, so that's what catalysis, um, catalyst poisoning mean. So a common catalyst poison for catalytic converters is lead. What it does is it coats the honeycomb structure of metals and stops it from working. The moment you have a non-reactant uh, absorbing themselves onto the surface, then that is what we call catalyst poisoning. Okay, so that's the end of uh, the lesson. We have uh, less than one minute um, left. I'm guessing um, I'll be will be um, disconnected anytime now. Uh, did I record? Okay, I did record. Okay, so um, that is all for today. Thank you, everyone. I will send you the slides for um, page 14 on WhatsApp for you to copy down. Okay? Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes. Go now. Bye. You're welcome. Thank you, miss. You're Bye. welcome. Yes. Bye.